So Christopher, welcome to Coffee with the Googler. It's great to have you on. Thank you for having me. So I know you are one of the people, you work on Google Brain and you're behind this distill for a great dissemination of machine learning. Could you tell us all about it? Yeah, so I guess maybe I'd, I'd split it sort of into, into two parts. Okay. Um, so there's sort of the thing that, that we're doing and then there's sort of how distill is a vehicle for that. So okay. software, we have this idea of there being technical debt, right? You go okay. and you write software, and you you maybe you don't always use good variable names. You don't document it very well. You right. don't you know you end up with all of these you know your your so you don't refactor it, and your your software becomes hard for people to go and build on and work right. with. I actually think a kind of analogous thing can happen in research, where if we don't explain things well, if we mm -hmm. don't sort of develop the right ways for, for thinking about things, it can become harder to go and, and build on research. And it sort of becomes right. this, you know, this mountain of, of papers where, you know, people, and I think people take pride in it, right? They're like, <laughs> you know, I spent all these years going and climbing this mountain, uh, yeah. and I got to the top, and I'm going to do more research and build up this mountain. Um, but I think right. often we actually could have done a much better job of making the mountain sort of easy to climb. Yep. And so what Distill is really trying to do is to create a vehicle where people can do that kind of work and, and do really amazing work of, of that kind mm -hmm. and have it be acknowledged as a, as a real sort of contribution to the community and, and be the sort of thing that, that can then help them get support in, in, in doing more of that work. So it becomes like really a best of both worlds kind of thing, right? Yeah. It's very accessible to the non-academic community, but it's also referentiable, if that's the word, you know, something that can be referenced by the academic community, right. so you get the best of both. Yeah, many of these things were sort of already just a, a better version of scientific papers, mm. um, but they weren't being counted as such. And so I think it's still a sort of a, a legitimizing vehicle um, mm. that allows uh, and, and I think we also provide some help to people in doing good work in this in this way. So there's all this sort of right. weird, you know, <laughs> bureaucratic stuff, and we just sort of tick, you know, crossed all our T's, dotted all our I's, and and sort nice. of set up, you know, uh, distills also peer reviewed and and created this, you know, this uh, a scientific journal. Except it's a scientific journal full of interactive diagrams where you know we really, you know, really if somebody's writing writing in a very academic style, we might you know encourage them to to try to do a little bit less of that. Right. Um, uh, and and sort of subvert what a paper is in, in some mm. sense and sort of and I think sort of explore what what's possible right yeah. I mean I'll, I'll talk about from my personal perspective yeah. and that is that like you know I have been out of academia for a long time <laughs> and I've been working in software and software development that kind of stuff but as I've been getting into machine learning of course I have to start reading more and more papers uh -huh. and as I'm reading those papers like as soon as I start getting into mathematical notation and sigmas and phi's and that kind of stuff part of my brain begins to go to sleep and it's not that I don't understand it, it's just it's so alien to me, it's so uh -huh. long in the past. And you use the image of a mountain and it's like, I used to be kind of three quarters of the way up the mountain, now I'm just in the foothills. <laughs> and it's a lot of effort to get climbing again. So with something like Distill and what you've been doing with Distill, it's been great for me personally so that I can start really beginning to grasp some of the concepts. And, and speaking of those concepts, it's like another thing you've been working on is Lucid, right? And, uh -huh. so, and you're using Distill to disseminate Lucid. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Or Yeah. So. I think a lot of this really, really traces back um, to to Deep Dream, um, mm -hmm. or, or maybe even a little bit further. You know, there's there there's a well, there's a, there's a lot of people, but there's a, a small cluster of us who've been working together who've been very interested for a number of years in in how how do neural networks really work and how right. can humans understand these sort of really really complicated systems. Mm. Um, and you you know a couple of years ago uh, we had these really exciting results where we we came up with all these techniques for sort of visualizing you know what what do neural networks think are think yeah. are interesting what do they and really see what, yeah. <laughs> yeah or I mean really really I think the right way to think about those images is they're sort of they're you know they're trying to make the most interesting image for for mm. a network as possible and so it gets filled with all the sorts of things the network you know finds finds very very interesting in some sense that right. that, it, that activates it right um, and so it gets full of you know dog slugs and you know who knows what else. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, and it's and it's a lot of fun, and it, you know it's even become this this artistic movement. Um, we there was this event at the Gray Area Foundation where um, people were like auctioning off you know art that was made with Deep Dream, and I was like, whoa, you this know this great. this thing that I was involved in is like <laughs> there's like real artists who are doing things. Uh, which I is, hope you have some of those. <laughs> <laughs> they were all too uh, too expensive for me to buy. <laughs> so Deep Dream, you know, I think part of what's exciting about it is is all this art, mm. um, uh, and you know I think. We were we were really excited to or really lucky to you know see this, I mean, there's all these amazing videos, but you know in addition to that um, I think you know we were you know it was also sort of really an, an attempt to understand what's going on inside neural nets right. and it didn't didn't stop there um, you know we we sort of um, continued thinking about this a lot um, and 
uh, then, a, you know, about a year ago, or well, like a couple months ago, um, we, we published this article um, on feature visualization, okay. um, which is sort of really exploring how can we take these techniques that we started developing with Deep Dream um, and then go and turn them into, uh, you know, turn them into tools that are sort of, instead of just trying to make interesting images, really understand what, what individual neurons in the network are looking for. Okay. And we, we discover, you know, in you know, early layers, it's looking for edges. Okay. Um, and then, you know, it starts to look for textures. Um, and then it uses the textures to describe, you know, simple patterns like stripes and fluffy balls and logos and hexagons and, you know, clusters of circles and, you know, these, I don't even know what, like, putty, like, spear like things. And then those get turned in to, you know, simple sub parts of objects like, you know, a button detector or a, a flower detector or a patches of cloth detector or a bubble detector or a chain detector or a nose detector. Okay. And those get turned in to sort of partial, you know, part, you know, partial objects like, you know, parts of buildings or people walking around or helmets or or dogs mm. with fluffy ear, floppy ears and little insect-like things. Right. And so that was sort of a, a really um, exciting transition, um, and it sort of was the, the result of us sort of fiddling a lot with ideas um, around Deep Dream, and not just us, you know, there's been a, a, you know, there's a, a big community of people who've been doing really exciting work in this area. Mm -hmm. um, and we sort of have been, been building on that and building up, building up infrastructure. Really, you know, that to us is just a means to an end where um, what, what that work was giving us was it was giving us a way to go and understand what are individual neurons doing? Okay. The individual neurons in the network. So there's individual neurons that seem to, you know, detect floppy ears and things like this. Okay. But then what we've been doing lately um, is we've been going and taking that a step further and going and saying, you know, how can we then use that as a building block in conjunction with other things mm -hmm. to try to really explore, you know, how the network makes decisions. Okay. And so I'll start with a, a simple example. Um, so over here, we, we have an image. Um, right now we're looking at an image of a floppy, you know, of this Labrador retriever um, and this tiger cat. Okay. That's actually apparently a species of, of cat. So there's... You know, they call them tiger cats. Yeah, I mean, there's real tigers. And then there's also <laughs> tiger cats, which I guess maybe they have stripes on them or something. But there's also, you know, like you have tabby cats, you have tiger cats. Apparently that's a tiger cat. I okay. wouldn't have known. Um, I wouldn't, <laughs> but actually, the network does. But the network does. It's really amazing. I wouldn't have, actually, I wouldn't have known it was a Labrador retriever either. Uh, I, I, you know, the, the network really, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's pretty phenomenal. Mm. It classifies, you know, dogs into more than 100 species. And, you know, I, sort of, I don't even know the names of 100 species of dogs, let alone, you know, <laughs> how to go and tell them apart, but the network can. And one thing you might wonder is, how does the network do that? Right. Um, and one, one really exciting thing that we'll see is, well, let's, let's just dive into this for a second. Sure. So if you, if you, if one of this, this interface here, it allows us to, to go and look at the vectors and the neural net runs the same detectors at every position in the image. Um, and normally that, you know, those detectors, they all give a, a number output that sort of describes how much they fired. And normally you get this so-called activation vector, and it's just a list of numbers. And it's sort of really inscrutable. You're like, you know, neuron 53 was firing a lot. Well, what does that mean? Right. That's not very useful to me. It doesn't tell me very much. You okay. know, neuron 134 also fired a, a bunch, but neuron, you know, neuron, you know, neuron 12, it didn't fire. Well. Great, thanks. That's, that doesn't tell me anything. They're on 12 was having a bad day. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But what we can do mm. is we can combine it with the, these feature visualizations okay. that give us a sense of what, what the neurons are looking for. Mm -hmm. And we can combine, we can create this, we call them semantic dictionaries, where we have you know, these, these things that sort of give us a, a name for the neuron. They give us a sort of a visual s symbol that describes what they're looking for with how much they fired. And that's, that's a lot more informative. So if we look over here, you know, all over here, we see that there's these floppy ear detector neurons mm -hmm. that are, are firing really intensely. Um, it turns out that you know, this, this neural net, Google net, has a really rich vocabulary of different kinds of ears. And that's a really big part of how it tells apart animals. So you know, it has different kinds of floppy ears. You know, it, not just floppy ears, but you know, there's these longer floppy ears. There's these mid-length floppy ears. And then it has all sorts of pointy ears as well. And like, right. you know, slightly like ears that are sort of in between pointy and floppy. Um, here we're, we're seeing that these really these two floppy ear detectors that are firing pretty strongly. Um, that's really interesting, but it's something that would have been completely opaque to me right. without going and combining these techniques together. Right. Um, and so that's sort of the first thing we're doing. And we can look in other places. So there's a snout detector over here that really is firing pretty strongly. Um, and uh, if we go over here, um, you know, now we're seeing some pointy ear detectors and sort of a cat face-like detector. And you know, that almost looks a little bit like an ape detector, but it's firing a little bit, a little bit over here. And if we go down here, we see you know there's these fur detectors and these leg detectors that are firing. If you go down here to the grass, you know, there's some grass detectors, but they don't fire very strongly because that's not very interesting. Mm. And we can look at other images. So, you know, over here, 
Um, we have this fellow with a with a you know with sunglasses and a and a a, um, a bow tie, and you know, uh, it turns out there's a bow tie detector. Um, and there's also, you know, a neck without a bow tie detector. And what I really liked about this one was that, like, the um, the bow tie and sunglasses look similar, right? It's two dark oblongs joined oh, yeah, by a yeah. small bridge. Wow. And, but this was actually able to detect the difference oh, between yeah, the bow no, tie it, and sunglasses. It's really, it, you know, you can see here, and you can see that part of what part of what it's doing is it's like, you know, it's it's looking for the chin above the 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 bow tie. Um, and I think also for sort of the shirt with buttons a little bit below it. Um, so there's these other things that are cueing it, but it, it actually has a pretty, you know, sophisticated sense of what a bow tie is. Mm. Um, and also has the suit detector and, yeah, the, the, the other neck detector and, yeah, and here's, you know, some kind of face detector that seems to mostly be about, like, noses and mouths and skin texture and, you know, there's, um, the sunglasses detector up here and, um, I don't know, let's look at this one. You know, it turns out that this has, you know, a, a, a vase, uh, mm -hmm. you know, top of vase detector, body of vase detector. Um, there's sort of a flower detector. Um, there's an antler detector that helps it detect the handle. Um, oh, interesting. Yellow spheres. Um, and th that was another thing that was interesting in this one is because the lemons at the bottom of the image are yellow oblongs and the tulips at the top are yellow oblongs. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But, you know, despite those two being very similar, that it's able to detect that they're different things. Yeah, and in fact, um, if we well, I'll I'll go to that in in a second. But there's there's some other one. There's some some we can see some interesting things about how these all sort of play together in a second. But yeah, so I think the first thing is just you know, this is allowing us to understand you know sort of look and look at which neurons are firing and and see what's going on. Oh, I want to show you the pig for a second. The pig is a great example of something that has lots of pointy ear detectors. We might have to move around a little bit to find a place where the where we're really getting all the pointy ear detectors to fire. There's two, but um, there's some places where more fire. Um, well, maybe I'm not going to be patient. Oh, yeah, there's a bunny here. Okay, so we have pointy ear, pointy ear, pointy ear, and then like some kind of rabbit-like thing with mm. with another kind of pointy. It has this whole vocabulary for talking about you know different kinds of ears, and I don't have anything like that, and I love it. <laughs> um, uh, right. So that's that's the the first step. Um, but we we sort of we wanted to go and take that a little bit further. So another thing that you can do is you can ask you know what do all these neurons together represent? And so we you know there's all these neurons that are firing to different extents. And if we instead of just trying to visualize individual ones, we ask try to sort of visualize them all together. We mm. sort of see what the network sort of collectively saw at that position. And then if you stitch those together, you can kind of see how the network saw the whole image. So you know here's our our, our um, you know. Uh, uh, um, pig or hog or whatever it is, um, or our cat and our dog. And you can see, you know, really seeing the, the ear here and the snout and the, the cat head and the legs and the grass. Um, or, or over here, you know, the, the top of the vase and the handle and the flowers and the lemons down here and the wooden surface and the background. And, uh, or, or over here, you know, there's the bird on the chain and it really sees the bird's beak and the feathers and, you know, the chain and all of this. I mean, it's, kind of, it's kind of interesting. Pretty incredible. And then we can actually go a step further. And the way that these networks work, remember, is they, they have multiple layers. They build yep. up their understanding over the course of a bunch of layers. Mm -hmm. um, and so initially, they're really, you know, let's zoom in here. Um, you know, initially, they're really focused um, on uh, relatively simple things. Um, in fact, we, we don't show you the first layer, but it would really be about edges. Right. And here, but here it's sort of, you know, it's getting really simple, you know, combinations of edges or maybe the beginnings of textures. Um, but if we go down, you know, just two more layers, um, we now have, we're skipping a layer in the middle here, uh, we now have, you know, this thing where it's really got a, a much richer sense of textures, um, and it's starting to get a bit of 3D structure. Mm. And if you go a little bit further down, now we, we, we're seeing the chain and the beak and so on, and if we go a little bit further, it's sort of become more abstract, and it's sort of birds and chains. Um, and similarly, if we go, you know, let's look at the dog. I, I love this dog and this cat. So, you know, here again, you know, very simple sort of patterns with really mostly about edges. But, you know, you go just a step up, and now there's fur textures, there's grass textures, there's, you know, this, you can really see that there's this 3D structure where there's boundaries and sort of, um, you know, surfaces a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and then you go, you know, another step, and it's starting to understand eyes too. Um, but now, you know, it's really got like the snout with eyes, the ears, the the leg, um, and so you can really see these jumps in its sophistication of understanding the object as you go up. And this is part of the magic of distilled, right? So this isn't just a dry academic paper with yeah, illustrations in it. We can see you interacting with it. We can see you actually seeing what a neuron is seeing and getting hands on to that. So it helped me to learn a lot more about what's going on. Yeah, I think it was just something extremely powerful about allowing people to, you know, there's sort of these pictures that I have in my head, um, and 
there's, I think there's sort of actually two interesting things going on. So one is there's these pictures I have in my head, and by, by really turning them into interfaces, mm -hmm. um, I'm sort of able, able to crystallize those pictures into things that I can really test my intuitions against, right. and that can sort of, um, you know, offload some of the thinking that I have and imagining what this would be, sort of what's going on in the network, and really reifying it, really turning it into this thing that I can interact with. Mm -hmm. And then not only do I get that for myself, but I get to share it with other people. And so they get to now see, you know, this thing that's, I think, deeper than what one would, would normally get, where it's not just me telling you results, but I'm, re I'm really sort of sharing this way of thinking about it and sort of interacting with, with these, this, this type of problem. Right. Um, and I think that's, that's really, really exciting. Yeah, I mean, because to me, there's there's two levels of opaqueness with machine learning, right? First of all, is learning it to begin with, uh -huh. you know, which is already opaque, and then secondly, is like when you start dealing with models, it's 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 a black box, right? It's uh -huh. a, there's a there's a trained graph in this thing <laughs> that you give it a picture and it tells you what's in the picture. So there's a it's not like source code that you can open up and step through and see what's going on. So though between those two levels of opaqueness, it's really really hard for somebody to get into this and to learn it. And what I like about this is that this is cracking open the second of those, so I can begin to really see what's happening in the network and help me understand the network and then later on help me to build and tune my own networks uh -huh. right so which is which is super cool so now lucid where does lucid fit into right. this picture so, so with all of this you know we've been we've been building up all of you know we building up all of these tools um, and we've been building a lot of infrastructure to go along with it. And so one of the things we're really excited about um, with this paper is we're also open sourcing all of all of the infrastructure that we built up to go and do this research. Okay. Um, and so that includes both that that first feature visualization article that I was showing you, where yep. you know all all of the the tools you need to go and, and produce images like this, where you you visualize what a neuron's looking for. Um, and then also um, to to go and you know th that's also what underlies all of all of these tools that we have here. And the neurons in this one are they just trained on something like Inception or? Yeah, so these are for both articles we're using um, this network Googling Net, um, okay. which was at one point a state of the art model. Uh, it's now several several years out of date, um, but it's one that we sort of have used for a while as a as a sort of standard test for 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 visualization. Okay. Um, it seems like it actually there's some kind of something a little bit mysterious about it, where it seems like the neurons in Googling Net are like especially correspond to ideas that sort of human sort of are are meaningful to humans. I see. Um, it's a fun one to start playing around with. Cool, cool. Um, but you know, you can go and plug in whatever model you want um, and try and use these techniques on it. Nice, nice. We actually made um, these notebooks um, that reproduce each one of the the diagrams in the paper. Oh, cool! So you can go. You and can get then, hands on. Yeah, so you can you can just sort of you know it, it's there's sort of this continuum where you can you can just read the paper passively. You can you can engage with the diagrams, and you can go a step deeper and go and start playing around with one of these notebooks. Um, uh, and you know, so here we have you know a notebook for for these these activation grid visualizations, um, and then you can go and and you know uh, just you know uh, I guess we have to open it in a playground. But it used to be like once upon a time that you'd read a paper and you'd try to understand what was in the paper and you'd try to figure it out and maybe there'd be a bit of source code <laughs> and you'd take that source code but then you'd have to go and find a data set of images to train but you'd have a different data set than the people in the paper had and there are all these like th these concepts these frictions these little bumps that you have to get over and right and now we can sort of make it this continuous transition where you can be reading the paper you can be like I I want to play around with this diagram a little bit and sort of start doing that you know I want to go a little step further and start actually playing around with the code and fiddling with it and if you want to really dive in, you know, we have all of our, our codes open source and you, yep. know, you can learn the library a little bit by playing around with the notebooks and then go and... Super cool. Now, and as you mentioned, if you want to start playing with it, all the code is open source. So say yeah. I'm, a, I'm a developer and I want to learn this stuff and I want to get started now. Where would I go? Go to tensorflow slash lucid on GitHub. Okay. Um, that's our repository. Um, and from there, you can get access to um, you know, tutorials um, on, on using it and, and a, a list of notebooks to go and play around with. Okay. Um, and then from, you know, the next step after that is you could, you know, you well, you might come up with some ideas after you've gone and played with some notebooks, and you might want to just use code that's very similar to what's in the notebooks, so you could start writing your own own fun things. And um, you know, a lot of this could also be used for for artistic purposes, where uh, cool. uh, you know you you can certainly do you know traditional deep dream style stuff. As right. well. and, and also your papers on Distill. I'll put links to them in the description Fantastic, of this video, yeah. so that people can go there. And get yeah, them the, yeah. I think that probably what I would do first is I would read the papers, yeah. and then I, you know, from the papers you can go on and, and drum, jump to the the notebooks. Right. Um, or or after you've read them, you can also look at um, the Lucid repository and look at more tutorials and stuff like that to, okay. to play around. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Christopher. This has oh, been so much pleasure. fun. You know, it's like uh, we, <laughs> we 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 just we've been sitting here for a little while geeking out about this stuff and. It's 
that's one of the things I love to do. So thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for watching this episode of Coffee with a Googler. If you have any questions for me or if you have any questions for Christopher, please leave them in the comments below. We'll also have links in the description below to everything that we spoke about today. So uh, thank you so much again. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button. And remember, we'll have a TensorFlow channel on YouTube. So go check it out. Thank you so much.